Joining us now is Dr. Bernice King, the daughter of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. Thank you so much for taking time to, to speak with us today. We know the, the King holiday is mm -hmm. quickly approaching. It's a very special day. I know the theme is it starts with me shifting the cultural climate through the study and practice of Kingian nonviolence. What do you hope people receive from that message this year? Well, I'm hoping it will start a revolution of people becoming more interested in literally not just talking about Dr. King and nonviolence, but taking the time out to study it. We have the means now through the King Center for people to uh, log on and do their own self-paced study of nonviolence um, as emulated by, introduced by, uh, and taught by my father. So we have the e-learning. Uh, experience. It's about 16 to 18 hours, but it's at your own pace um, so that you understand how to utilize it beyond just social justice. Use it, utilize it in your workplace, utilize it in your home. There are liter literally a lot of individuals who said, this has transformed my marriage. Mm. Um, so we have a workplace edition that's shorter, three and a half hours. So uh, people can talk to their employers and say, hey, we, we want to take this on. Um, and so that's what it is. And, and for us, nonviolence is a, a love-centered way of thinking, speaking, acting, and engaging, <clears throat> excuse me, that leads to personal, cultural, and societal transformation. Uh, so this year I am emphasizing, we at the King Center emphasizing, please, let's take some time and really study. Why do we need to study it? Because it was effective in society. It, is, it has a track record you know, a proven track record of bringing about social transformation. Um, and we desperately need that right now because we're responding and we're reacting. And most times it's out of our emotional space. But nonviolence really takes you to a higher level of critical thinking and processing and engaging so that you're not in the business of just trying to move people to the side, counsel them, destroy them, demolish them, diminish them, derate, der berate them, and all of that kind of stuff. Nonviolence helps us to elevate elevate to a whole nother different level and find pathways forward that are healthy um, for everyone. Yeah, we always think about the King Center founded by your mother. Uh, thousands of guests from all over the world, not just here in our community, not just from here in the United States. Uh, why do you hundreds think- Hundreds of thousands. Yes, hundreds of thousands, <laughs> That's great. So Perhaps millions. Why do you think people uh, are so willing to travel from far and wide to come to the King Center and, and learn more about your father's message? Inspiration, hope. You know, people want to connect. Some people want to pay their, their homage uh, to my parents. Um, some people want to find out more. You know, some people love history, and this is an important part of our history and what he contributed. And so sometimes I don't think people in Atlanta understand what we have here. <laughs> you know, we have, first of all, we are the only African American National Historical Park in the state of Georgia. We have won a few around the nation where you have some of the original and authentic assets, the birth home the church. Uh, SELC is now part of that park, that SELC headquarters where my father worked out of from 1960 to 1968. Um, now they have the home that we grew up in that will at some point in the near future open up to people. Um, and you have his final resting place with my mom and the center that was founded as the official living memorial to the life, work and legacy. Where can you get all that together? Um, and so it's, it's a wonderful experience and, you know, it's not about entertaining yourself. We, we're really in the business, I call it of, you know, edu entertainment. It means educating, <laughs> inspiring and entertaining at the same time. We talk a lot uh, lately in the news about the approach people do or do not want to take to learning history or how they want to shift it or may not want people to feel bad. What do you think we should be learning about your father's legacy, about black history. What do you think we should be doing as a nation? In terms of learning? The black. history as black history and in our history of things that maybe aren't so pretty, things that you know people may not want to think about that were done in our, our nation, but did transpire. I think we have to use every platform possible um, to educate people. And when I say every platform, I mean the NFL, I mean the NBA. Um, they have a very large platform uh, that transcends political party, faith tradition, um, you know, race, ethnicity, everything, gender. I mean, 
they're there. Uh, they have an opportunity to use their platform to really, you know, present some things that are being challenged now in the school settings. Um, so I think everybody kind of has to do their, their part. I think corporate America has to play a role in that. Um, how do we in the corporate setting um, present these things uh, to, to our corporate community and, and our customer base? I mean, we got, this is the time to be innovative and creative. Whenever someone tries to shut you down or shut you out, that's just time for innovation and creativity because it may mean that there's something we've been doing for so long that we need to change and we're so accustomed to doing it that way, you know, and we don't want to get out of that pattern. So this kind of jolts you and says, okay, now I got to think a whole different way. So I think those are the things uh, that we have to do. And the beauty is we also have these museums, you know, all over the nation. More are, are, are coming on, online. Um, and I think as many people as possible, you know, take your families, encourage your friends. I'm constantly encouraging people to go down to Montgomery uh, to the Peace and Justice uh, Memorial, Lynching Memorial, and also the um, Legacy Museum from Enslavement to Mass Incarceration, which really helps us to understand contextually how we ended up where we are from, from slavery to this mass incarceration, this systemic racism. How did it get embedded in our, in our society? Um, and I've been pretty you know, successful in encouraging people. I'm, in fact, I'm going down um, in April with an evangelical group <laughs> of all people. Um, and so these doors open and you have opportunity to use your influence. You know, we gotta plant seeds in different ways, in different places, and whoever you have access to, use that as an opportunity, you know, to do a little bit here and there. And, and, and sometimes these museums are a better way to introduce it to people, to open them up. Um, and eventually, it won't seem as threatening to people. It's, it's that initial, let me open it up. Now, some may never come along. Don't ever expect it to be 100% of anything. You know, but if we can touch a, 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 a great percentage, um, I think we can see some change and transformation. Because there's a, there's a generation in waiting. They're just not where we are yet in terms of leadership, but they, they think different, <laughs> you know? So in the meantime, we have to do these things to kind of get it to them yeah. so that when they come into our roles and positions, we won't, this won't be as prevalent as it is today. You mentioned Atlanta. And when we think about this city, there's such a rich history and legacy. What do you think Atlanta's impact is and its legacy when it comes to black history? Well, I think obviously there's a history here, um, especially during my grandfather's time, um, Daddy King, Martin Luther King Sr., my father's father, obviously, um, of black leaders of influence uh, working together um, with, with business leaders at the time um, or people who um, influence uh, the city in different arenas and trying to work through very difficult issues. Um, and uh, we've had a, l a long history of that. We're at a new phase of that now because it's a broader, more diverse community now. Um, and we've got to find a way to go back to our roots, you know, of how do we pull together all of these groups, especially those that are more marginalized and having the fair representation of them in the discussion dialogue and into the decision making, more importantly, not just like a listening session, but taking those things into account as we conceive of things or as we move things forward, we don't leave out their considerations. Um, we, we were good at that. And, and I think we're t teetering on trying to get better but if we're not careful, we may lose that. Um, but I think that's one of the, the, the greatest things, that we have been um, a city that it literally was, was too busy to hate and did not let um, anything like hatred and, and racism stand in the way of rising to an occasion um, to make decisions that are beneficial to, to all people. Um, do we get it right every time? No. Um, but I think there's in the soil of our city uh, the, the, the intention of that. Um, and as long as that's there and with these institutions that we have, we have a rich history of education, you know, with the Atlanta University Center with all the black colleges. 
the rich history with you know the the black businesses that we've had Atlanta Life Insurance is still around Citizens Trust Bank you know one of the oldest black banks um, and and then of course the rich tradition of our, our faith community um, and entrepreneurship you know we <laughs> we are the largest contingency of black entrepreneurs in the, in the nation so there's a lot here um, it is a mecca of sorts in that way. People always tell me, you know, I have opportunities here I don't get in other places, and that's true. I remember I had a friend once, he came here, and he said, my God, this was just, it was just like a cultural shock, because he's from Kentucky. Yeah. So he came here back in the day and went to Greenbrier Mall and saw all these black people, <laughs> like, wow, I didn't know there was that many black people in the, in the United States. Uh, and it's yeah. all as a result of the work that's been done. It's the work that's been done, you know, from, and I, I don't give it credit just to my, father, but my great-grandfather, mm -hmm. you know, A.D. Williams, who was a pastor, first founding president of the Atlanta chapter of NAACP, who fought for and was successful with the first black uh, public high school, which is Washington High School, where his grandson, Martin Luther King Jr., and grandson, A.D. King, and, and granddaughter, Christine King Ferris, went to eventually. So we have a, a rich tradition in our family, and there's so many other uh, rich traditions of, of strong leadership here, black leadership here in Atlanta. We have seen a lot, especially as um, we saw an incident recently, you mentioned the birth home there. We see, mm. especially this time of year, people like to quote your father, mm -hmm. and it kind of comes out during that time of the year and kind of fades away. How do we maintain that legacy and how do we make sure that we're sharing it? And that's beyond the, the work that the, the King Center is doing. How do we make that pervasive in our community here in Atlanta and across the country? Well, it does start with the King Center, though. I mean, I think Atlanta has, for a few years, kind of neglected the fact that the King Center is here. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of re rich resource uh, at the King Center, and I think there's a lot that we bring to the table that can help us build bridges and truly create the beloved community. Um, um, and uh, so I, I just want to say that. Um, I do think it's a collective coordinated effort. You know, a lot of times people want to do their thing sometimes because people want credit. You know, we have a lot of that going on in our society. But I think when we find the power of the coordinated, think about this. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference was a, a conglomeration of a hundred ministers obviously attached to churches a hundred is a lot working collectively in a coordinate now it's different to say we collaborate what are you doing what I'm doing oh let's do this here this this is another thing to say collectively we're gonna target this and we're gonna stay focused on this until we see substantial change and transformation I think that's what we have to start doing um, as a unit, looking at the King holiday as a measuring point. What do we do to move the needle as it related to housing? I know there's a lot of effort on that right now under the mayor's leadership. Um, how do we collectively, collaboratively be a part of that? Because at the end, I want us to say, we did this together as a city, our faith leaders, our civic leaders, our corporate leaders, you know, um, our grassroots leaders, et cetera, our young people. But I don't know we, if we're able to say that right now. Yeah, it takes us all, yes. it certainly does. Dr. Bernice King, thank you so much for your time and your service to not just our community, but the whole world. Thank you so thank much. You.